We read scripture this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll read Deuteronomy 6 and then into chapter 7. We read this along with our treatment of Lord's Day 34 as it treats the first commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers." to cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord has spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, 
Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. We read God's word that far. May God bless his word to our hearts. As stated, we take this passage in connection with Lord's Day 34. Question and answers 94 and 95. Found in the back of our Psalters on page 20 and 21. Question 94, what doth God enjoin in the first commandment? That I, as sincerely as I desire the salvation of my own soul, avoid and flee from all idolatry, sorcery, soothsaying, superstition, invocation of saints, or any other creatures, and learn rightly to know the only true God. Trust in Him alone. With humility and patience submit to Him, Expect all good things from Him only. Love, fear, and glorify Him with my whole heart, so that I renounce and forsake all creatures rather than commit even the least thing contrary to His will. What is idolatry? Idolatry is instead of or beside that one true God who hath manifested Himself in His word, contrive or have any other object in which men place their trust. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, we hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us through Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Those words are the revelation of the living God, Jehovah. And those words reveal Jehovah as the God of His covenant. Jehovah is the God of heaven and earth. He's the God who has created all things, who continues to rule all the nations, who rules all men as Lord of all. And yet he's God of his people in an altogether marvelous and wondrous sense, in love. He's embraced and taken us to himself in love. And he owns us as his peculiar possessions having chosen us before even the worlds were established, setting his love upon us, not because, as we read, we were more in number or we were better, not because of anything of ourselves, loving us purely according to his own sovereign good pleasure and making us his own property in Jesus Christ and giving us to know his blessing. Jehovah God as Redeemer comes to us, His redeemed children, and He sets before us His will. Now God did that with regard to the Israelites, having brought them out of the land of Egypt. We know that Egypt is a picture of being brought out of the bondage of sin. 
we who've been brought out of the bondage of sin and death now stand before Jehovah God. And God comes to us in love, and God testifies of the wonder by which He's saved us. He's delivered us. We belong to Him. And He now, as the one who has redeemed and delivered us, says to us, be thankful. Live in thankfulness. Live to the glory and honor of my holy name. And our response as his children is, how? How will we show that thankfulness? How will we show that love and that gratitude? And in response, God gives to us his commandments. He sets before us his law. This is the way in which you show your love and your thankfulness to me. Now we know that that law, as we noticed earlier in the catechism, convicts us and drives us to our knees. It causes us to see our own unworthiness, our sinfulness. Who can stand before the holiness of Jehovah God, which is revealed in His commandments? It drives us to the cross. We see in Christ forgiveness. But we see also in Christ the marvelous wonder by which He gives us His Spirit. And by the power of that Spirit, we can and we will walk in obedience to this great glorious God. He comes before us and says, Love me. Love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in response, as redeemed children of God, we delight in His commandments. We rejoice in the wonder of His love. And we pledge to forsake our old sinful nature and to live a new and holy life. We note that. This morning, with regard to the first commandment, worshiping the one God. Noting, first of all, the prohibition. What is it that's forbidden? And secondly, what is it that's demanded? The first commandment is basic for the whole of the law. And it's important that we understand in that regard the difference between the first commandment and the tenth commandment, and then the other eight commandments. An analogy has been used that is helpful. It's as though God's law is a beautiful, glorious mansion, this grand house. And as we enter into this house, that which is inscribed above the door into the house is, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This isn't a house into which all mankind are invited. It's a house for God's children for those who belong to him, his elect. And as we enter into that house, God's then commandments are found in the various inscriptions above the rooms. But we would make this analogy. We walk into the first room, and the first room is comprised of the first commandment. Then off that room are the other commandments, two through nine. And then going through those rooms... There's the room which comprises the tenth commandment. So that the first and the tenth really incorporate all of the other commandments. And in order to keep the first, one really must keep all of the other commandments. As we look at the first and the tenth, we'll see the way in which they differ then from the other commandments. But as we come into this glorious and wondrous mansion, we count it a privilege then, and we delight in God's will. And over the entrance of all of the individual rooms then is inscribed one of the other commandments. We desire to go in to enjoy the blessedness and the fellowship and the friendship that is ours with God in those rooms. The first commandment then gives us the introduction. Some of the rooms have to be entered before you can get into the others. And that's the case with this first commandment. The first commandment is basic. It's for that reason also that one, if one violates the second or the third, typically it begins with the fact that you've not kept the first commandment. You are making an idol out of something. And because of that idol now, you're pursuing some other sin in your life. Keep this commandment and you keep the entire law. Our relationship to God is the fundamental relationship in our life. 
And from that perspective, this is the relationship then that dictates all of the rest. God reveals himself to us as a personal God. He reveals himself to us as Jehovah, our covenant-keeping God. He's not an impersonal power that merely comes to us and demands of us something, who just speaks to us. He's a person. And he's a person who has embraced us in love and who has given us to know and to understand the marvelous nature of his friendship and fellowship. And we stand in relationship to him then as a rational, moral individual, and we listen. We hear his word. We hear his will. We're obliged to obey and to keep his commandments. We know that he's the one to whom we are called to devote ourselves, body, soul, and mind, with all of our strength. He's Jehovah whom we enjoy communion with and fellowship with. And he speaks of that relationship, that intimacy, and that tenderness that he has toward us. Now, the first commandment teaches us a fundamental truth concerning Jehovah God. God is one. There is only one God. There is no other God beside him. It's not such that there's a whole class of beings that are called God, and we have to make sure that we get the right one. God is not one of many. Jehovah alone is God. And that's the phrase that we sometimes use. God is God. And that emphasizes the fact there is none other. There is no one else entitled to take upon himself or herself that title. Jehovah alone is God. It's not as though God is one among many. That's the way the heathens talk. The view of the heathens is that they all had their own different gods. We have our gods. They said, you have your gods. And we're going to hold to ours. You prefer yours. But all of them ultimately will get us to the same place. They're going to get us ultimately to glory. This commandment demands of us a very different perspective. Jehovah, he alone is God. And he is God alone. There is none other that can be called or worshipped as God. An idol is nothing. It's a figment of man's imagination. An idol is not God and is not worthy of worship. The implication of this commandment is if you do not serve Jehovah God as God, then you serve an idol. And it's important for us to note that sharp contrast here. Many imagine that there's all kinds of different possibilities. We could perhaps serve the true God, or we could serve false gods or idols, or we could serve no God at all, or we could perhaps have some other random comparison or something that we would hold to that would involve Christianity or involve in general religion. The Bible is clear. Either you serve Jehovah God or you worship an idol. The first commandment leaves no room in that regard for atheists. And it's important for us to note that. Those who claim there is no God are fools, according to Scripture. The fool says in his heart there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. A fool is someone who knows what is true and then convinces himself of something different. He knows the truth, and yet then he violates it. The fool knows there is a God. All men know, as Romans 1 and 2 set forth, that there is a God. And yet that fool convinces himself, philosophizes within his own mind, until he imagines that from his life he's eliminated every trace of God. Now that's foolish. Man cannot eliminate God out of his or her life. He will never succeed. For a time he may suppress the consciousness of God and that God is. But he who turns away from the living God to put his confidence in things or in himself is an idolater. And he will face the living God and he will be called to give an account on Judgment Day. And all men know and fear that God. They may worship the sun, the moon, the stars, their own strength, any part of creation, 
But what they do then is they seek that object in which to put their trust. And the man who turns away from the living God is necessarily guilty then of serving idols. Now the implication of this then is that there's only two options. Either you serve Jehovah God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or you will serve idols. Natural man is given to idolatry. And natural man is given to the pursuit of his own selfish will. The creation of man and the fall necessitate that. God created man after his image as his friend's servant. And when we talk about God's creation of man after his image, we talk about the fact that God made men, first of all, different than the animals. The animals are not capable of bearing God's image. Man is, because God gave to man the intellect. God gave to man his humanness, distinguishing him then from the animal world. But on top of that, God then not only made man capable of bearing an image, God actually made man an image bearer of himself. So that man was able to resemble in a creaturely way God. The elements of that image had to do with righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. Man knew God. Adam was able to know God in righteousness and in holiness and was able to live before God in perfection. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that image of God. They retained yet the ability to bear an image, but now the image they bore was that of the devil. Unrighteous, unholy, and that which did not any longer have the true knowledge of God. The result is that man becomes foolish, and man now pursues his own will in every area of his life. He's totally depraved an image bearer of the devil. And his nature is such that he will seek a God. He has to be a servant. He must serve someone. And he will seek out someone to serve. He's going to put his trust in something or someone. Every man will, because every man, woman, and child is dependent. And as a dependent creature, they need that on which to put their trust. Everything around them proclaims their own dependency, that they cannot stand alone. So that when man turns away from God, as Adam and Eve did through the fall, they become then idolaters. They become those who now serve the devil and pursue the things of Satan. By God's grace, that image is restored in Christ. And by God's grace, we who are found in Christ, once again are able to know righteousness, holiness, and the true knowledge of God. And as those who are restored in Christ, we then, with joy and with thankfulness, pursue God's will. And we deliberately set God first, confessing there is one God, and He alone is the God whom we will serve. Question and answer Question answer 95 state, idolatry is instead of or beside that one true God who has manifest himself in his word to contrive or have any other object in which men place their trust. Any other object in which men would place their trust. The practical significance of this is very, very important. Idolatry is not just bowing down to a visible object as the pagans do. We often have that impression, and we look for idolaters then among those who actually have idols in their homes or have some physical thing that they would bow down to. Idolatry is the acknowledgement of any other power than that of God. And again, that's also what the first question answer here, 94, sets forth. That we desire the salvation of our own soul and avoid and Flee from all idolatry, sorcery, soothsaying, superstition, invocation of saints, or any other creature. And then later that I renounce and forsake all creatures rather than committing even the least thing contrary to his will. Idolatry is the acknowledgement of any other power other than God 
and the desire then to satisfy that power other than the will of God. In our sinfulness and in our depravity, we're inclined toward that idolatry. We seek other powers next to God in which to put our trust and to rely. And it's not very difficult, beloved, to see this tendency in our own lives, especially when things are going well. When things are going good for us, we begin to put our confidence in self. We begin to look to our own abilities. And evidence of that is seen very practically in the fact that we're not praying as we ought. We're not acknowledging ourselves as dependent as we should. We're not crying out to God for grace and for strength. We're going in our own strength. And when we face difficulties and stress, when we experience sickness, we put our confidence then on our own ability, on our own selves instead of on God. We want to be in control of things. We want to be God. We want to tell others what they ought to be doing. We believe that we're the ones who dictate the will of God with regard to our own lives and others. And we want to live our lives then according to what we desire, what we want, rather than the revelation of God. We find in our own obedience that which boosts our self-esteem. And we try to find in our obedience grounds for our worthiness before God. That I am worthy. I am a Christian. I deserve better because of what I've done and the things that I've performed. Beloved, that's idolatry. Next to the Lord, there is nothing. Jehovah is God alone. Everything is in his hand. And to place our confidence, to place our strength in anything other than Jehovah God is to rob the living God of his glory. When we're saved by grace, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we stand in the liberty with which Christ has made us free. And our response then to this commandment and to the language of this commandment is, Yes, Jehovah, thou art my God. Thou art my God alone. There is none beside thee. And my desire and my delight in is to worship thee alone. To learn rightly to know thee. That's the way in which the catechism strikingly puts the demand. What is the demand that's set before us? That I, as sincerely as I desire the salvation of my own soul, avoid and flee from all of those items and learn rightly to know the only true God. Trust in Him alone, with humility and patience, submit to Him, expect all good things from Him alone, love, fear, and glorify Him with my whole heart. In order for us to keep the first commandment, we need to know God rightly. It's striking that the Catechism puts that as the fundamental characteristic of obedience but also then negatively, the fundamental characteristic of idolatry. Idolatry is a denial of God. It's a false knowledge of God. It creates a figment of one's own imagination, and it calls that its God. Idolatry implies that the man who says this or says that concerning God is right. Instead of diligently saying, we need to listen to God's word. We need to find out what is it that God says concerning himself. Idolatry rejects God's word and what God's word says and says instead we're going to take this man's word for it. Or instead we're going to take this one's word for it. We're going to base our understanding of God on our own understanding. Now beloved, God alone is able to reveal who he is, what he is, and how he is to be worshipped and glorified. And the first commandment teaches us a very basic truth. We must be silent. And we must submit to God's speech. Let God speak. Let God tell us who he is and how he is to be worshipped. We don't listen to the world to find out how we are to live. We don't turn to the polls of men to find out how we are to raise our children. We don't search out popular trends in order to know What is it that we're to incorporate in worship? We stand before Jehovah God. And we confess, God alone is God. He is Lord of my life. He has a right to regulate and dictate everything pertaining to my life. And I then need to turn to Him 
in order to get the answers to all of the various questions I have in life. He's the one who reveals in his word how we are to live and how we are to conduct ourselves. And so we search God's word. We search the Bible. We attend to the preaching of the word so that we can be instructed in the true knowledge of Jehovah God. The first commandment demands of us then that we turn away from all human philosophy. We turn away from all attempts of man to say, this is what I think God is like. When man speaks of God from his own heart, his own mind, he's always a liar. He speaks of God as one who loves all men, one who wants to save all men. That's not the true God. That's a lie. That's a figment of one's imagination. We turn to the scriptures and we say, who is God? What does God say concerning himself? What does God teach us concerning his own will? We want to acknowledge him as he has revealed himself in his word. Now, beloved, this is very humbling for us. And this is something that we have to acknowledge, all of us, regardless of how well we think we understand how well we think we know God's Word. It doesn't matter how brilliant or how capable you or I am. Our human brain is not able to keep all things straight. And we are inclined to all evil. Due to the limitations that we ourselves confess, we need constantly to be going to the Scriptures in order to keep a right understanding and a right knowledge concerning God. God is so high above us. He is such that we cannot even begin fully to comprehend the greatness of his glory and being. And while we can know him, we can't even begin fully to fathom the greatness of that knowledge. And even then, God's revelation then is the only accurate source. But what do we do? We twist that revelation. We try to turn it to suit our own circumstance, our own situation. So that constantly we have to be going back to the Word of God. How often don't we forget things? And we say, you know, I don't remember exactly how God put it. And instead of trying to recall it from memory, we need to go back to the Word and find out what did God say? How did God set it before us? How often don't we have difficulty keeping things in a right understanding? We know we heard it, but we can't recall exactly how it was. Our hearts are regenerated. Our minds are constantly affected by sin. And our minds are such that they are proud. They are selfish. They are inclined to serve self. Our minds think correctly only when that understanding is in line with our hearts, our regenerated hearts. We're totally depraved, and that total depravity affects our minds. And we're a fool if we say, no, my understanding, my mind is completely, perfectly correct. I have everything clear in my mind. The child of God always stands in need of correction. The child of God humbly acknowledges, I always am reforming. I'm always striving to bring my mind into subjection to the will of God. And so I constantly am studying the word to improve and to correct my thinking according to God's word. I'm inclined to distort it. I'm inclined to sit in a situation where I listen to others talk and I become emotionally affected by the conversation so that my mind begins to go contrary to what God's word teaches. Beloved, at heart, this is what you and I have to acknowledge. I know what sin has done to me. Sin makes me a lover of myself. It makes me covetous, it makes me proud, it makes me disobedient, it makes me overbearing, it makes me unthankful. And so easily then, my mind becomes more and more conformed to the things of this world. And I start thinking along worldly ways. I think of myself more highly than I ought. I'm consumed with my own situation. I'm consumed with pity for my own situation. I think I need alcohol to be happy. I can't go through the morning unless I have some caffeine. I need to have that ibuprofen. I can't live without it. I need to have nicotine, otherwise I'm not going to make it through the next hour. 
I need, I need, I think that my life cannot go forward without these things because my mind and my thoughts are not captive to the Word as they ought be. And beloved, we need to examine ourselves then. Take the medicine, but do so looking to God for His blessing. If God doesn't use that pill or isn't pleased to use that medicine, everything's in vain. I remember an elderly saint telling me that they would always take their pills in connection with prayer. How important is that? If we're just popping the pills and we're not praying, are we leaning on God? Are we trusting in Him? Are we looking to Him? Or are we leaning on ourselves, on the medication that has been given, on the doctors, the nurses, the health care? Don't trust in the medicine. We trust in God. And we pray that God will make use of these means for my good, if He's pleased to do so. We look to God for every good thing. And beloved, we love this God. We love this God as we know Him from His Word with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Again, what does that mean? Is that a sweet, mystical emotion that somehow takes hold of us? It's above all the knowledge of faith. Faith works in us an understanding of God's Word. And as we delve into the Word of God, God works in us the knowledge of God and of His love. And faith responds to that love of God in Jesus Christ and causes us to seek Him, to seek His will, to seek His face, to keep His Word, to live before Him. Knowing the true God, we fall before Him in worship and in adoration. My Lord! My God! And we desire to live in harmony with Him. He's the one for whom we live. And in all of our relationships, in all of the situations of life, in all the decisions we make, we're saying, Lord, how wouldst thou have me to live? I search the Word. I correct my own misunderstanding and views and wrong ideas. He's my Lord. He's the one who knows what's best for me. And He knows the way in which I can make it through a day. He knows the way in which I can live in my relationships. And knowing Him, I put my trust in His will and in His way. I put my trust in God alone. In times of war, we don't trust the horses. We don't trust the airplanes. We don't trust the armies. We don't trust the tanks and all of the equipment. If we do, they become our gods. We pray to God to preserve our young men. And we pray to God to grant unto us the victory, if it be His will. We don't trust in our own abilities with regard to the work that God has set before us to support us. If we trust our own abilities again, and we trust ourselves to get out of debt, we're looking to the wrong one. Jehovah is God. He's the one alone who's able to grant me what I stand in need of. We don't put our trust in money and possessions, in our business, we don't make of these our gods. All of this can be taken from us in a moment. God can so direct our life that He exposes our idolatry and He robs us of everything that we thought was so crucial and so important for us to live. We trust in Jehovah alone because He loved us before the foundations of the world and has given us a Savior in Jesus Christ. As we read in Deuteronomy 7, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Know therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He makes the devils to tremble. He reveals his love in Jesus Christ so marvelously and wondrously that we fall on our knees. We're not worthy. Who are we to be loved to such a degree? But whatever devils or wicked men may do, we fearlessly cling to Him, knowing His will is good, submitting to Him, loving Him, 
and glorify Him. The Catechism identifies the way in which we show our obedience. We must serve Him with our whole heart. Submit to Him, expect all good things from Him only, love, fear, and glorify Him with my whole heart. God demands of us right worship in accordance with His will. And in that regard, there can be no divisions in our life. That we have part religious, a larger part really not having much to do with religion. God demands our whole life as individuals, body, and soul. In our various relationships, in the home, in the church, in the world, in school, everywhere. We desire to do everything in accordance with His will, not committing one thing contrary to His law. Now why does the catechism make an issue of that? As soon as I'm pursuing something contrary to God's law, I'm saying, I know better than God. I am God. So that maintaining God's will with regard to the first commandment demands of me that I not give any place to sin and evil. When I do, I deny God, as Adam and Eve did in the garden. Out of thankfulness for what He has done for me, the wonder of His redemption and salvation, I serve Him with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now we know God created man to have that relationship with Himself. And either man is going to hate God, or by the wonder of God's grace, he will love God, and he will serve God. Every human being has, as we understand, the ability to bear the image of God, but God has not so ordained that all mankind bear that image. God has reserved that image only for those who are renewed in Jesus Christ. Every human will serve a God. God created man as servant. Every human is always serving someone. They make that one their master, their Lord, and they live for that one. Right knowledge and right understanding of God and of the will of God will always work in us that confession, Thou alone art worthy. And God turns us then from our own foolishness. He turns us from our own idolatry. And He directs us to Himself. I will put my trust in Him alone. He is worthy of my recreation. He's worthy of my thoughts. He's worthy of my eyes, of my brain activity. He is the one alone who is my focus. And right knowledge of God is always then going to exalt His name and confess He alone is worthy. The knowledge of our depravity is such that we can never trust ourselves. And we always then are going back to the Scriptures. As your children grow up from your mother's knees, you're taught the beauty. The Bible tells me so. And that's the confession that as we get older, we continue to make and to teach our children practically. This is what governs our lives. The Bible tells me so. It's not what I think. It's not what I feel. What does God say? And by faith, we cling to His Word as that revelation of Jehovah as Creator, Redeemer, and our friend. And we serve Him then antithetically. As we live in the midst of this world, We're saying yes to God, and we're saying no to idolatry. And that characterizes our whole life because God has placed us in a world that's given over to idols. And He's given us a nature that's inclined to idolatry. All around us are temptations to pursue the way of our own pride, our own will, that way that seeks self. As we live in this world... We do so as gods. We belong to Jehovah. We are His witnesses. And we are called then to renounce all the things that are against God and to stand as His friends in the midst of this world of darkness and sin. He will tell me how to live. He will show me the way that I am to go. He teaches me the attitude that I am supposed to have. When my parents correct me, 
I know that they're speaking the truth according to God's word, then I can't rise up. I can't rise up in judgment. It's not my parents that I submit to. It's not my teachers. It's God and his word. And when God's word is being set before me, I then submit. God's word is what dictates my attitude toward my parents. It's God's word that dictates my attitude toward my teachers. And God demands love, fear, glorify him as his friend. You know what it means to love God? To love God is to know him to be good. It's to know him to be great. It's to know him as Jehovah God, filled with all perfections, as the one alone worthy of all of our adoration and all of our fear. And right worship, then, is constantly striving to do what God would have me to do. Not what my boyfriend, not what my girlfriend wants me to do, not what someone else desires I do. I seek Him, and I trust Him, and I look to His Word, and I believe that He will keep His promises, even when it hurts, when obedience hurts me, and when because of obedience I lose relationships. I might even lose my job. I believe God's word is true and God's promises are sure and I bow before him. His revelation is right and his revelation is such that I must live then in humility with biblical patience clinging to him. I don't expect good things from myself. I don't expect good things even from my parents or from my teachers. I expect all good from God only. And I fight against the powers of sin around me, not only, but against that which rises up in my own mind and my own nature. Beloved, you and I take up this battle in the confidence of the victory of the cross. We are idolaters. We serve self. We pursue our own will. Sensitivity to this commandment drives us to our knees as we see our own unworthiness and we see our own sinfulness. And it drives us to seek after Jehovah God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength that we might grow in sanctification and in love toward Him. It leads us to see our great need for forgiveness. And God assures us, you are forgiven. Beloved, what a great God we serve. We pursue our own will. We don't put our trust in Him. We think that we know better than Him. And he forgives our pride, our self-seeking. He alone is worthy. And he leads us to the cross where we see that our Lord Jesus Christ paid for all our sin. And he drives us to repentance so that we cry out for mercy and we flee from the sins of idolatry. We pray for the grace to bring our minds more fully into conformity with the will of God. And we lay hold on the wonder of His grace by His Spirit. By His Spirit, He leads us. He dwells within us. And we pray, teach me to crucify my old flesh more fully. Help me to forsake the world. And beloved, God doesn't flee. He doesn't forsake you. He's with you. He gives you that grace. He gives you that strength so that you can pursue that way of obedience, that way that gives Him glory. We pray, strengthen me to live a life of holy devotion and trust to Thee alone, my Lord and my God. And in response, God gives us that response, that assurance that gives us our only comfort in life and in death. The Lord, Thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and keepeth mercy to them that love Him and keep His commandments. He's the one who has set his love upon us. His mercy fails never. And we who belong to him will be preserved and kept by the power of his grace. And though our sins rise up against us, the testimony of his spirit in our hearts is, you are forgiven. You have been atoned for Christ's sake. Live before me with humility. Love, fear, and glorify him with all your heart. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy Word. And we thank Thee for the Spirit by which we are able to understand that Word and by which that Word is applied to our hearts. 
Forgive us our own idolatrous thoughts. Teach us more and more to trust in thee with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And grant unto us the grace by which we might know thee truly as Jehovah, our covenant-keeping God, who will not turn away from us thy favor, but will continue to all eternity to shower us with thy love, thy grace, and thy mercy, that we as thankful children might abound in thy service as thy witnesses here below, testifying to the greatness of thy glory. Amen.